everybody. Buonasera, good evening. It is a pleasure, honor to uh, uh, host and present this event for Algron tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Nicola Santoni. I'm a principal of Lemniscap. It's a blockchain investment and advisory firm out of Hong Kong. I'm so excited to listen what uh, the speaker of tonight is going to tell us, so I'm going to be very, very brief. Uh, if we, we are here, uh, for sure we share the same vision. Uh, we believe uh, the, in, in the social and societal impact that this technology will enable. Uh, I think we, we all believe this is the second business model for internet, where the value, the wealth is uh, going to be distributed to the network owners, to the network uh, actors. Uh, we, we believe in expanding the design space, uh, allowing us to accrue value from this disintermediation model. But overall, we believe in these new wild technologies and we support pioneers, uh, technical architects that will make these technologies reality. So, uh, without further ado, tonight the speaker uh, left Italy in 1979. It probably was time to get back. Huh? Uh, is now back here in uh, 1983. Uh, is at MIT after earning his uh, PhD at Berkeley's. He won so many prizes that if I'm gonna list them now here, it would be the evening would be over. Uh, Godel Prize, RSA Prize, but overall, tonight will be speaking for us a uh, Turing Award, with the audience well know is the uh, equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer scientists. So please. Give it up to <laughs> Silvio Micali. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. And um, Nicola, thank you very much for a very kind uh, introduction. I'd like to give you an overview of Algorand. Um, um, and let me tell you right away what uh, you are going to see. First of all, it's a new blockchain. But not because it's new, because it's number 2001. That's easy. <laughs> so it's, it's new because it's actually quite different from the traditional one. So sometimes it's better to bring down an edifice, an edifice and then uh, start from scratch than trying to patch up something that is already there. And in fact, it's actually built on, uh, built on first principles. And some of these principles are novel too. And um, what I'd like to convince you also, most importantly, that actually is a way of doing things, a blockchain that allows as the seeds of uh, continual and consensual evolution. It's not clear right now how this comes about. Hopefully, it's going to be clear uh, in, a, in a little bit. I don't need to tell you. Blockchain promises a lot of things, and a lot of good things, right? You know, being fast, transparent, uh, introducing trust between uh, people who are not trusting each other, uh, frictionless, secure, or distributed. That's why uh, we are here. That's why we love them. And uh, somehow, all these promises have actually generated a lot of interest in the market. Uh, even right now, it's over $200 billion uh, uh, valuation of various you know, uh, chains. And uh, I don't need to start a listing all the applications you can do with the blockchains, you know, better than me. And there are going to be new ones as well. But, what is the but? That there is a, whatever um, Buterin referred to the trilemma. There are three important properties in a blockchain. Scalability, security, and decentralization. And according to the trilemma, you are welcome to choose any two out of the three. However, it's impossible to have all three. So we are going to challenge this uh, trilemma and try to see to achieve all of them. And all of them are important. First of all, security is uh, clearly important. Traditionally, when you talk about security, you mean uh, security of the protocol. So a protocol is a communication protocol. You have to send certain messages 
according to the rule. If you're a bad guy, say, I don't care about the rules. I'll send whatever messages I want. And you can do a lot of damage about this. You have to be secure against this. And blockchains, by and large, are satisfied that. However, a, a communication protocol is actually executed over what? A communication network. And if you are an adversary, what are you going to attack? Only the protocol because the gentleman only attack the protocol? No, you are going to attack anything that is a target. You are going to attack the protocol, and you attack the very communication network on which the protocol is run. And unfortunately, you know, if you take the traditional uh, blockchains, they have no security, little discussed about, but very true against the type of attack. When you attack the network by, say, cutting wires, meaning isolating a large part of the world, uh, not for more communication, but only from Bitcoin uh, messaging. And, uh, or you can uh, uh, infect the routers and the route traffic in a rather different way. You can really bring down a blockchain. If you do this, you can do a lot of damage. So right now, unfortunately, this is not quite there. Another thing that we need is scalability. I mean, if you want to have the currency of the world, the blockchain of the world, if that's the way the world interacts, there is a lot of us in the world. And if we really want to interact, it's going to, we are going to need the scalability. Unfortunately, a typical blockchain uh, coughs up, right? You know, seven transactions a second. What do we do in seven transactions a second? Very little. Here is something we can do. I can buy some tokens now with a great idea that a year from now, I sell them at a higher price. That's two transactions. Buy now, sell a year later, seven transactions a second. We could do it. But if we really want to buy a meal at a restaurant and things like this, so we are in big trouble. All right. So. Why do we want a centralization? Well, because you know, uh, in a centralized system, you really must trust this, uh, some parties. And it's a good question why you should trust them. And second of all, you create a point of failure. Even though they are trustworthy, somebody can actually attack them and destroy the system. And then, you know, monopolists, after a while, they start to raise price for no good reasons. Okay, That always uh, happens. So decentralized, instead, you know, um, systems, um, uh, the users control their own data and assets, right? They, the system is much more resilient because you don't have, you know, any single or double or triple point of failure. And, you know, there is no reason to increase uh, fees because uh, somehow nobody's going to say artificial increase fees for no good reasons. However, we always talk about decentralization, right? In the papers between us, uh, decentralized, we believe in the, we believe in decentralization. I'm more decentralized than you are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in you know, all this is aspiration because I mean, technologically, these blockchains today are not decentralized at all. So as we all know, somehow uh, free mining pools uh, control the blockchain of Bitcoin. I'm coming from Shanghai and actually discovered that two of these free money pools are owned by the same entity. So <laughs> Ethereum is controlled by two money pools. Are we going to say that two is decentralized and one is centralized? No. So unfortunately, we don't have that either. So in some sense, you know, it's kind of hard. It's going to, oh, voice is back. Uh, to have a decentralized, scalable, and secure system. And uh, let's see, how do we, do we try to get you know, uh, these properties? Proof of work, you know, that is the first, we all know, very expensive, very slow, and generates a centralization. So expensive and fast, sometimes is OK. Expensive is slow, excuse me. Now, expensive and slow and uh, centralized, no. All right, so then what is our next? So represented the proof of stake. It's a very simple idea. We are a customer to it. So it says, what does that mean? Oh, we take this good 20 people in charge of choosing the next block for this month. And worry not, because next month, different good trustworthy 20 people. OK, is this decentralized? No, this is centralized by definition, right? Because <laughs> anything, so. EOS says 21 people are in charge. Ashikov says 21 is no good. 50 is the right answer. 50. 50 centralized and 21 is centralized. From what I'm concerned, a fixed thousand is centralized too. 
And even if we are very, very wise, and we can actually choose 20 really trustworthy people, these 20 trustworthy people have a very big target on their chest, shoot me, shoot me, meaning that if you mount a denial of service attack against 20 people, which is very easy to mount even against 1,000 people, what happens? But they can no longer choose any block. Why? Because they cannot see any new valid transaction not yet in the blockchain. Because their buffers are full completely, and therefore you can grind a blockchain to a halt. It says, and what do you gain? Are you kidding me? There are people who are just evil, pure, and simple, right? I mean, think about 9-11. What did they gain? You know, they lost their lives, the, the attackers, and they tried to destroy <laughs> goods and properties and other things. So that is not a good way to go. Bonded proof of stake, that's another alternative. It says, okay, delegated, forget delegated, bonded. Okay, what is bonded? Well, it's a very simple idea too. That means that we allow 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, as many people as you want, to push some money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it. And anybody who has put money in the table is actually uh, capable of deciding the next block. And uh, your influence in controlling the, the next block is proportional to the money that you put in the middle of the table. And by the way, if you misbehave, your money is confiscated. Wow, this should work. Does it? Well, let me ask a, a much simpler question. And you're going to say, take the typical user and ask him the question, how much of your disposable income can you afford to push in the middle of the table where it is not invested, not in bonds, not in stock, not in anything, hostage? And the answer is very little. So in a system like this, you are going to make not only legal, but actually easy for big thieves with deep pockets to put much more money than others in the middle of the table in order to control the blockchain. Okay. She said, but uh, so what? If they misbehave, we confiscate their money. Really? Two answers. Answer one, there are bad people. That's a fact. However, and there are many. This is also a fact. But there is another fact, that there are much fewer bad people who are also stupid and bad. Okay? That is uh, not, not many of those. And uh, because I must be really stupid if I do something that causes the confiscation of my money, there is plenty of bad actions that I can do. Of course, if I sign A, and I digitally sign the opposite of A, whoop, my money is gone. But if somehow I want to, say, um, not to put uh, um, somebody's transaction in the block, are you going to confiscate my money? Of course not. So which transaction? I didn't see it. So there is a lot of stuff that you can do that doesn't trigger anything. Answer two, okay. Confiscate my money. I really did something very bad, then you confiscate my $10 million. However, I made a billion dollars because we have to agree on one thing. A blockchain that really works, that represents the world, is going to be worth a lot of money. There is a lot of money there, right? Because the world is a very big place in the world. So if there is a, a successful blockchain, it should have been on, in custody altogether in assets, a trillion dollars. So you can do certainly earn a billion dollars in some bad way. And if the price that you pay is $10 million gets confiscated, so be it. See if I care. That's the cost of doing business. And it's actually very cheap. So in a bonded proof of stake, there is no relationship between the true value of the blockchain and whatever money is in the middle of the table. And by the way, there are very legitimate operators, financial operators, who have a lot of money. Think about a bank who lo loan, lends money to all the blockchain. There should be such a thing. Where is the money? Well, on loans to everybody. How much do I have to put in the middle of the table? Little. You see, if I'm a bad guy, you only put one in the middle of the table. You see, there is no relation. It's a really a very um, bizarre way. OK, so these approaches uh, do not quite work. And um, that's why it is really true, experimentally, that if you look at the project we have, and here are just a few of them, that very often you don't get three out of three of the properties. Sometimes you actually don't get even uh, two of the three. And here, if you take a decentralized, uh, most probably it's another cross, right? If you say um, secure, well, uh, if you consider network attacks, then for sure not. So even if you give the benefit of a doubt, nobody uh, gets it. So my claim is that you know, Algorand is really um, a novel approach that actually solves this trilemma. So let me actually make it a thing. OK, I give myself three check marks. That's easy. It takes a, a stroke of a pen 
and that's it. But the question is, how does this happen? So, so yes, our goal is as good as everybody else's goal. The only question is, we all have good goals here, right? The question is, do we have the technology to attain our goals? That blockchains are all and foremost about technology. So it's technology that is going to set us free to collaborate securely in such a great global fashion. It's not a question of lofty goals. It's a real question of tech. OK, Algorand works. In, um, is based on proof of stake and uh, these other two properties, one at a time. What does it mean, proof of stake? That means that the system is truly distributed, meaning that every token has the same, the same uh, value as any other token. When I say every token, I don't mean the token in the middle of the table segregated the tokens. All token possessed by everybody in any way, shape, or form, somehow. If the majority of the money is in honest hands, the system should be uh, safe. And, um, and somehow, that is, uh, by the way, you know, my, in the typical blockchain, what do you do as a user? Oh, you can spend your money. Congratulations. So who decides things are to do the block and think, oh, we, the miner, or some other external force do it for you? No. So if, if there is a system in which the world uh, cooperates, everybody should, should participate. So in Algorand, we really insist in very uh, participation. So, and uh, we make it very easy. We make it very simple to, to, to participate. You might as well participate. Thank you for making it so simple, but you know what? I don't want to participate anyway. Okay, at least delegate your participation to somebody more responsible than you. So it's very sorry. Even though its participation is easy, I don't want to do it. Even though I can delegate, I don't want to do that either. You know what? You don't belong here. Find some other community. There is 2,000 blockchain where you're very happy to have your money in which you do nothing at all. So that's a different story. So in Algorand, is a participatory system where it's made very simple and, uh, and uh, low cost, low computation, uh, very simple to participate. And then, by the way, it says, uh, yes, you should be a good citizen. But you know, if you participate, you're going to be rewarded. We don't reward the miners. We reward ourselves. If we participate, we actually have incentives to participate. And if you delegate, you also have incentives. So it becomes very hard to really say, I don't want to do this. People can say, yeah, no, no. But you know, you lose money. If you can make some money for free with making a, uh, just a very simple participation, take it. If you don't want to do it, really take a bit less money and delegate. Otherwise, you don't make money. It's, not, I mean, it's a very simple proposition. That's uh, the way the system works at high level. And, um, and then there is going to be some, uh, um, uh, how do we uh, choose minimal computation for generating the next block? And we generate the block in a way that is really bizarre to think. We actually agree, the entire community, a billion possible people, on the next block, on every single next block. It's only a question of technology. It sounds a very hard thing to do. That's why in uh, the Nakamoto design, everybody works very, very hard, and only somebody succeeds. You know, we are going to reach consensus globally, and, and, but very in a super fast way. And uh, another good thing is that, you know, you know that sometimes there are forks. I don't mean hard forks because you want to split the community. It's just the soft forks that happen so naturally because two people solve a crypto puzzle a few things of each other, and you have a split. And every time you have a split, what happens? One of these two branches eventually die. And therefore, the fact that you see a block doesn't mean that this blocker is going to remain in the blockchain, because it may vanish if, if it is super, superseded by a longer branch, right? And in Algorand, instead, this is not possible. Algorand does not fork, period. It's one block after another, after another, after another, never a fork. So as soon as you see a block, if you, a payment to you is made in this block, that's money in the bank, <laughs> okay? You're done. The, the transaction is final. And um, you know, just think of financial system in which, uh, with some probability, a wire transfer disappears. Uh, the system grinds to a halt, right? I mean, uncertainty is not good in finance or anything else. And, um, and finally, I think that is um, the most important property of a blockchain is the following. So let's start. What is a community? Well, it's a, it's a live thing because it's made by people, OK? And people change, and they want more and more things, right? As we say in Italy, and I think it translates, appetite grows while eating. You know what I mean. So are you happy with this property, property A, B, and C? Yes, it's a very good property. Well, 
after a while, how about D? How about E? Or oh, you want property D? Form your own new blockchain. Start from scratch. Or, but I'm already in a blockchain. Have a hard fork, split the community, split the currency. Really? Anytime we want to have a change and to split the community, this does not scale. This is not, this is not a plan for action, okay? So what do we have here? Instead, we have evolvability. Why? Because the, essentially when we, the mechanism, the consensus mechanism in Algorand consists of propose and agree, done. Not a deluded. Propose and agree, done. Propose and agree, done. What do we agree upon? 99.9% .9 of the time on the next block. But the same mechanism can be used to agree on a new rule or on a new monetary policy. You propose, if we agree, we adopt it. For hard fork, no, we are done. We consensually, right? That is the power. And I think that that's the way in which we are going to meet not only the current goals of the community, but also actually the future ones that we don't have, um, uh, we don't know about anymore. Okay, I'm going to tell you some technical details a little bit um, lightly um, uh, later on. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, this general overview and then some technical de details, and then uh, Shaver uh, Kaya is going to tell you about you know, um, um, uh, other uh, parts of the development, parts of the project. So very high level, at this overview level, so here is this proposal agree system that I'm going to tell you about. So, Remember, we want to be totally distributed. So one random token is selected. He ought to belong to somebody, to some public key, that key. That public key belongs to a person or an entity, that person. That person proposes a new block, okay? So it is, all right? And then proposes a new block, and uh, the selection of this person is extremely fast. Done. We have a block proposal. But we don't know if the proposal of a block is going to tell you the same block that it tells me. So we are going to have actually an agreement step in which a thousand users are randomly selected. And, uh, and these users reach agreement on the block proposed by the first person. Okay? And um, why do we need this uh, second phase? Because in any society, and a blockchain is not dif non difference, there is a percentage of bad actor. Maybe in some society there is 1% a criminal. It could help maybe 2%. If you live in a very dangerous society, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, okay? But they're not in a majority in any society, the, bad, the criminals, why? Because otherwise, there is no society. Just in, assume that we get out of here and the police somehow robs us, okay? No good. So we go to court, the judge incarcerates the innocent. I mean, the jungle is a much preferable place. So therefore, even if you have 10% of bad actors, when you choose one person to propose, one in 10 times is going to be a bad person. It can propose different blocks to different people. But when you select a thousand, then with overwhelming odds, the majority of these 1,000 are good, even though they are 10%. Just look at probabilistic. What is the chance that you choose a random sample in a population where 10% are bad, you make a thousand, you take a thousand of them, and you have a bad majority. This probability doesn't exist, okay? is essentially zero for human speaking. So therefore, because we have an honest majority, we actually agree on a common block, even because it's an agreement process, even though uh, there can be different blocks initially distributed to, to the people. Right, that is enough for now. Okay, so look at the currency, because Algorand is both a currency and a platform, and the benefits of the currency is really something to be very secure, even against the network attacks and anything else. In um, um, the people um, participate in the network and in the governance for a change, because we have the technical solution that enables people to participate. And then you have actually, uh, actually some uh, stability that is going to be uh, generated algorithmically by essentially a decentralized virtual treasury. Remember one thing, these things are important, why? Because a cryptocurrency is a currency. So a cryptocurrency is by definition at the crossroads of cryptography and, the economy, and economics, right? Except that techie people design the cryptocurrency and they are not economists. <laughs> so somehow price stability was not even thought about it, right? So if you have scale, but the currency fluctuates like hell, how the hell are you going to transact? Assume that um, Amazon gives you a price in New York and a price in Algorand. So you can buy either way, 
okay, I have some algo, say, so I'm going to touch this button. Well, should I touch this button? What is the price of algo right now? So this is good. So, well, if I wait maybe 20 minutes, maybe it goes down, I get a discount of 10%, maybe I should wait 10 minutes. So scalability is not enough if you don't have stability. Or actually, what we believe is relatively stability, I am, uh, that is the right model, more to be said later. And then we are going to have, uh, um, as a benefit of the platform, is a really fast scalable way to secure transactions. Is an open platform in which everybody is welcome to build and is actually better off to build. And we are going to give you all the APIs uh, and all you need to have you know, to design your own system is going to be a very pl a flexible platform. And you're going to make it you know, by developing on top of Algorand even more uh, um, valuable as time passes by. And there are actually financial benefits because I believe that Algorand is committed to democratize finance, okay? Be <laughs> we want to make very sophisticated financial tools available to the common man. Right now, that is not available. Only the chosen few have access to very, very fi um, sophisticated financial tools. Everybody else is happy to, to pay and do very simple things. We want to change this, this way. We are very committed to have uh, MEX available with financial tools to everybody. OK. And uh, by the way, we have, um, I must say, quite a deep roadmap. And uh, some of the things which have immediately in our focus, and some are, uh, we, we know we have them, but we are going to deploy later on for strategic uh, and market reason too. And one is secure incentives, OK? What does it mean, secure incentives? What are the incentives? Is the situation when you want somebody to do what you want to say, you know, you do this, I'll pay. And because it's decentralized, you have actually some rules on how you get paid. The moment in which you have some rules in which you get paid, what happens? People see money, and they no longer care what, why you are offering this money. They say, I want to maximize my money. Thank you very much. Right? Who cares about what you want? So by the way, people think miners is like, so, oh, there are miners. Oh, today is rains. Right? It's nature. No, miners is not there from nature. Miners are, if you want to know my opinion, the subproduct of an incentive scheme that Nakamoto got wrong. And everybody that does proof of wrong copied the wrong thing. Therefore, we generate miners. It's not that Nakamoto say, I am vision. He said that. Hatoff had a great vision. I envision something distributed. Some, they didn't say, on top of these things, I envision the rise of money pools. Who cares about money pools, right? He didn't want them. But the incentive scheme that he did, because it was not well thought out, generated all this. So what we want actually is a secure incentive scheme in which we guarantee that when people maximize their money, we don't get centralized by chance or by error. Okay? And uh, we are going to have uh, Dutch auctions on chain. OK, that is good. You know, Dutch auction is uh, the quintessential fair way to price things. You know what the first thing we are going to offer um, in an auction is our own currency, our own tokens. We never sold a token, period. At lunch, in the mainnet, we are, we are already at the test net now, at the mainnet, we start a sequence of Dutch auctions. And these Dutch auctions are not a smoky room auction in which you suggest some price. You know, Dutch auctions are a bit complicated, but very, very fair. And then somebody, yes, yes, I know what you say, what you bid, yeah. And then he says, congratulations, that's the price. Because there is no guarantee of fairness here. So you're going to see all the bids on the blockchain, so you know they're going to have a fair price. And everybody plays the, the same price. So the typical ICO is rather different. The typical ICO is says, hey, I fix the price, one token, two euros. How many tokens do you want? And he says, well, is this price fair? What do you mean? My token, my price. If you don't like it, don't buy. There is nothing fair about this. And on top of it, you know that I actually sold in a pre-sale my own token at 10% of the price to my friends and my family. Is this fair? No. How can sense of a community you build if everybody is unfairly treated from day one? That somebody else got the token it is unimaginable, right? So we want to do. We, are, we got financed only by selling equity in our company, which is an honorable and non <laughs> traditional way to do things. And our tokens, we sell at auctions. What is the price? You decide the price, not, not us. Right? It's, it's the market that decides the price. 
And, uh, and then uh, we are going to have this uh, algorithmic stabilization. And uh, how does it work? I don't have the time to tell you, but somehow <laughs> one thing that I know that you can say is that uh, you contract the supply, you inject the currency in conservation. So you must have money at your disposal to play this game. In the typical ICO, okay, everybody gets a cut of the money and then sell or donates the other. Right? It's like if you have a bunch of guns, you fire them all and now you have no ammunition. There is nothing you have to do. You cannot regulate or intervene in the economy. <laughs> you are a prey to the winds. The, the winds blow from the west, you go east. If it blows from the east, you go west. There is nothing for you to do. So that is part of the benefits. And by the way, we are going to have other things like you know, smart square contracts. What does it mean? Smart, smart contracts, because smart contracts right now are, uh, you know, are a little bit a grungy business, right? So you cannot have an ICO and a smart kitten born at the same time, or things like this. We certainly want to do better than that. And we are going to have actually some treasury bonds, because a currency, I'm sorry, but needs bonds. What is a bond? Well, it's a way to earn money for an interest. You give me a thousand algos for a year, say, and if it's a 10% interest bond, in a thousand, in a, in one a year, I give you your thousand and plus a hundred back, right? Why do you want to do that? The treasury is flesh full of money. It's the treasury of algo, right? So that is a favor to the community because you need to know what is the financial health of the community to which you belong. And assume that I propose to you, give me a fast an algo, and in a year, automatically on chain, because you, know, you see that I have all this money in, in, the, in the blockchain written, I give you 100 more back in one year. If you think that the algo is going south, are you going to accept my proposal? No. You rush to an exchange and sell, sell, sell as fast as you can. So that is a way to establish that I have a confidence in, in, in the algo. And if later on you get the same bond at 5% interest, you are more confident. We need to express our confidence in the algo, not by blogging and say, I'm very confident in the algo. Well, put your money where your mouth is. And so we need this to have, an, in fact, that's why one of the reasons for which people have bonds. We shall have bonds. All right, and uh, that is, uh, as a synopsis, that's it. There is, um, uh, I hope you get involved, because <laughs> the world is a big place, and either is a very nice represent <laughs> representative of, um, um, of this world, and uh, we really want to have you know, um, uh, an Italian community among us, and uh, so participate, develop, and join. And if you want to join, as uh, going, going back to slide one, that's how to do it. Okay. So I would uh, ordinarily have some immediate Q&A, but if you are not exhausted, rather than do a Q&A now, I can proceed directly to the next part, which gives a little bit of a technical explanation of how we do this. And then, shower a call, so we'll have a Q&A at the end. Fair enough? Done. OK. Let's get dirty, OK? A little bit, not too much, because still is But in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, what are the techniques of algon that allows you to do all these things, to solve a trilemma, et cetera, et cetera, that other blockchains don't have? First of all, we are not representative proof of stake. We are not bonded proof of stake. What are we are? We are a pure proof of stake. Defining means that, first of all, no punishment. We could confiscate money, because that is easy, right? If you do the wrong thing, we don't even want to do it just to signal that the right way to do things is to make cheating impossible. The notion that the system is secure because you punish ex post the cheaters is a fantasy in which it's very easy to indulge, right? Because you say, in our blockchain, if you steal, you cut your hand. Oh, it makes you feel good. It never happens. Thieves have always existed, okay? What you have to do is to make it impossible to cheat. That's a much better uh, and honorable way to do things, most secure. And by the way, the money is always at your fingertips. Nobody asks you to segregate your money. And uh, if the majority of the money in your fingertips, ready to be spent, in bonds, in, um, in another vehicle, financial uh, um, uh, system that uh, you are going to create for us or we create for you, it doesn't matter. You take all of them. If the majority is understands the system work, period. There is nothing to cheat about, OK? That's what the pure proof of stake is. 
And um, so I, essentially, technically, every token has the same decision power, and this is really the ultimate distributed system. How do we get that from this? Through technology. There is no other way around, right? Because if you have, say, 10 billion tokens, and every token has to be counted on, well, you know, yet to have a technological uh, uh, sound uh, solution, otherwise you still talk and talk and talk and try to, to continue. So let me tell you how it works. It works by effortless one-by-one -one Byzantine agreement. What does it mean? Good question. Let's start passing for you, okay? First, let's start effortless and one-by-one. Here is what it means. You remember what is B1. B1 is the first block, also called the genesis block. Now, the problem on a blockchain is to agree on the next block. But the genesis block, we don't need to agree <laughs> because it's part of the definition of, of the system, right? It's there. Everybody knows what the genesis block is. OK. Block number two is not clear at all. We have to agree on it. What is next to the block? A favor, a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this um, favor gently goes down effortlessly, the chain unfolds. So gee, where are the forks? That's a, an optimistic scenario. Where is proof of work? There is no forks. That's what I was saying. And there is no proof of work. We have effortlessly a chain, one block at a time, and no block ever disappears. Period. That's the way we're going to work. Why? Because we use Byzantine agreement. Well, what is Byzantine agreement? Byzantine agreement is a, a communication protocol invented by Pist, Shor, Shor, Shorter, and Lamport some, some 30 years ago. Assume that we are the participants in this protocol. And if we have an honest majority among us, then two properties hold. Property number one, agreement, what does it mean? That if we start, each one of us has a value in his head, which is different. Each one has his own value. At the end of a conversation, all the good guys have the same value. That's agreement. You can see what value does this guy have. We don't care. The good guys must have the same value. What is the second property? That not only they have the same value at the end of the conversation, but if they started with the same value, then not only they agree on a common value, but they agree on that value. Why? Because otherwise, to get agreement without consistency is easy. What's the problem? You want to have all honest people agree on the same value, uh, no matter what value you start with? Instruction, one step. No matter what value you have in your mind, if you are honest, output zero. Yes, ma'am. Done. All honest guys done the same thing. What have we achieved? Nothing. Because what we really want, if we started with 27, we have to agree on 27. No. Agreeing always on zero, no matter what, is not a solution. You need the both of these things. And by the way, what is the relation with this and the blockchain? What is the problem in the blockchain? Chaining the blocks, everybody uses it. the same techniques to chain the block, right? The hash of the previous block is part of the next block. That's easy. That is a 50 years old technology done. The whole problem is to choose the next block. And what do we do? We agree on the next block. So everybody of us has in his mind these values are, in my opinion, the next block should be that. In your opinion, it should be that. You know what? I don't care which one of us win, but we must have the same block. That's what is important, right? So that's what the Byzantine agreement is. You want to reach Byzantine agreement on every block. There is one problem. This problem invented over 30 years ago is very slow. And moreover, assumes that the set of players are well-defined, they are fixed, and known to everybody. In a permissional system, first of all, you're going to have millions, if not billions, of participants. So that slow is bad. And second of all, the system is not fixed, right? Because everybody's welcome to join in. So you don't know, I don't know, or even right now in a large system, who are the participants. So we have a lot to do. But the bottom line, I want you to remember that. That Algorand delivers Byzantine agreement on steroids, period. That's what we want to do. And by the way, when people want to deliver Byzantine agreement, by, but they can't, there is a grammatical trick. They put an adjective in front, call it practical Byzantine agreement. It's very misleading. Why? Because you think practical Byzantine agreement is better than Byzantine agreement. No. The adjective, no matter what it says <laughs> in natural language, once you put them together, I mean an apple. You know, they play grammatical tricks like this. We are going to give the original Byzantine agreement of peace, uh, Shostak and Larkov on steroid. So in Algorand, again, is based on the assumption that honest majority of money, 
And the technical advantage is that computation is trivial. Why can you participate? Because what you ask to do is a few addition, a few computation, comparing two integers, sign one thing, oh, big deal, or verifying a signature, nothing. To decentralization, because who is in charge? We are in charge. In fact, we all are encouraged and even incentivized to participate, and we can do it because it's so easy. So there is a single class of users, us, whoever owns the currency. No miners, no anybody else. Finality of payments, why? Because there are no forks in Algorand. That is actually a lie. Because there, there are potentially forks in Algorand, but are very improbable. How improbable? The probability of opening a fork is 10 to the minus 18. And what does it mean? Let me explain what it means, how I chose this particular constant. 10 to the power 18 happens to be the number of seconds from the Big Bang till now. So this thing means that if you produce a, a block a second, which is pretty good, you have to wait the age of the universe to see a fork. You know, this is the probability I can, I can live with it, OK? So for all practical reasons, there are no forks. And then scalability means that, that we generate a block as fast as we can propagate it. And by the way, Nobody can generate any faster. Why? Because to decide if block number n plus 1 is right, is correct, is valid, you have to know what are the transactions of block n. Right? Because some transaction, otherwise, <laughs> you can do double spending and other things. So this is an inherent limitation. But well, that's the only limitation. We generate a block as fast as you can be. And by the way, we have security against a, a, a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. OK? However, worry not because we are here our ground to defend against this bad guy. So let me tell you what the bad guy does. This bad guy can immediately corrupt anybody who wants, say, provided it does not corrupt more than a third of the internet, which is very hard allegedly to do for, a, for anybody. And um, he has, he can, if he corrupts you, you become your loyal robotic servant, and you, you might do whatever he wants. And uh, he can attack the protocol, he can attack the network, he can do anything, but he cannot forge signatures. And by the way, if your signature scheme is secure, not even a national state with huge computational resources can forge your signature anyway. So that is uh, pretty good. And by the way, I believe it is important to protect against this adversary. Proof, if you have a trillion dollars of value in the blockchain, adversaries are going to come up as mushrooms after the rain and very bad adversary are going to come up, and they are going to spend lots of money because there is a much gigantic amount of money to be made. So you are better protected against a very tough adversary, not to those uh, static adversaries. You want to have these, uh, these guys. OK, I, as I told you, Algorand works in two magic phases. First, a random user is selected with probabilities proportional to the money he owns in the system. And what does this user do? Proposes a block. As I explained before, in phase two, a thousand people are selected. And what do they do? They agree on the block. OK? That's what I said. If you say, well, Silvio, thank you for saying so. But you know what? I have some doubt of this high level. You know, I'm not convinced uh, that, uh, about the soundness of the system. There are a lot of cues in your mind. And fortunately, we have the answer, too. So how can I prove it to you? By choosing the one single most popular answer and answer that. And then later I remain around. You can ask me other, uh, other questions as well. And um, in, in doing this answer, we are going actually to extract some rabbits out of a hat. Because if we don't start doing things strange, then we end up doing whatever Bitcoin does. And we know all that goes. Right? So we are going to do things a little bit weird. So the first most popular question I get is to say, gee, it seems to me that the power of all this business is in this 1,000 people committee. And you say they are randomly chosen. That's why, with overwhelming probability, they have the majority. Who chooses the committee? Well, if I tell you in Algorand, I choose the committee, is this a good idea? No. Right? Good. OK. Second thing is to say, no, in Algorand, we all agree on this committee. So you must be kidding. Because to agree on anything, humanity, it takes a long time, right? So it might, we might as well agree on the block directly, because the notion of agreeing on a committee who then agrees on the block is nonsensical. So what do we do in Algorand? We do something a little bit counterintuitive. The committee 
members select themselves. It's a G. This is a bad idea. In fact, it's the worst idea, right, that you have. Well, not so fast. Because what does it mean to select yourself? To select yourself, to become a member of a committee, you run a cryptographically fair lottery that with the right probability selects you for membership in the committee. So we want a thousand committee members. Assume that there are a million people with roughly the same amount uh, of all of them. When the, the system sets the lottery probability of winning to one in a thousand, because a million divided a thousand is a thousand. If the system has a billion people, then the system sets the probability of winning to one in a million, because a billion divided a million is a thousand. You get the idea, right? So you have, you have, uh, uh, you, you run this lottery individually, no communication to anybody, and you cannot cheat in this, because this is a cryptographically fair thing, so not even a national state can alter the odds of being selected in the committee. And either you win, in which case you have a winning ticket, meaning a proof that you won the lottery, and therefore your opinion counts on this block. And if you win, and only those who won are invited to propagate their winning ticket together with their vote on the block, up or down as it may be. OK? OK. And by the way, that's why it is important that your probability of being selected is proportional to the money, how much money you want. Because otherwise, I can conduct a civil, civil, uh, civil attack against the system, meaning that I have a million algo in one key, in one public key. I split my money against a million keys, and, uh, right, and then maybe with one algo each. But the probability algorithm to belong in the committee, whether I have one key, single key with a million algo, or a million keys with one algo, is absolutely the same. OK. OK. Let me argue that this way of doing things at this high level as it is, is super fast and super secure. Let me argue super fast first. How long does it take the lottery? One microsecond. Gee, that's as fast. And by the way, in the same microsecond, I conduct the lottery, you conduct the lottery. So whoever wins says, I won, here is the ticket, and here is my opinion about the block. Is this slow? No. Good. How about security? Okay. Assume now that I'm the big, scary guy that I told you, right? That I can corrupt anybody, instantaneous and things. Okay. I decided, you know, whom should I corrupt? That's my problem. Because I want to corrupt the committee. But who belongs in the committee, I don't know, because it's determined by your own lottery that you run in the privacy of your computer. So I see somebody is going you know, next to the Duomo. Should I corrupt him? Should I corrupt her? There is somebody in Thailand. Uh, should I corrupt that person? I don't know, because I don't know who's going to win. OK. But after you win, what do you do? You propagate your winning ticket. So. And your opinion. Now I know who is in the committee. A thousand people roughly show up and propagate this. I corrupt them immediately. But so what? They already said whatever they had to say. And their messages are virally propagated over the network. I can't stop that. I cannot put those messages back in the bottle no more than the US government or any government can put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. So the system is secure because beforehand, I don't know whom I should corrupt. And ex post, doesn't matter if I corrupt or not, you know, um, uh, very, I cannot influence the outcome anymore. Right? That's the idea. So in sum, no force, no minors, no proof of work, etc. trivial computation, perfect scalability, and by the way, all these other things that in some sense I claim any true blockchain should have. Governance, security against the network partition, secure incentives, and maybe bonds and other things, and, uh, and something else. Mm -hmm.